I sleep best in the woods. Isn't that weird? I mean, you would definitely think that like a plush mattress and an indoor heated room would do it for me, but nope. For me, it's an inflatable mat cramped inside a tent, curled up inside a sleeping bag, and I am out. 10 hours minimum. I've thought about this a lot. Maybe it's the stillness and the quietness of nature or potentially the backpacking that precedes the sleeping that tires me out properly. And I'm sure those things have something to do with it, but I think it's primarily the fireside meal. I cannot explain this, but freeze-dried chana masala that you eat out of a bag next to a fire after hiking all day, it's better than like a Michelin star dinner at a new restaurant in Portland. And I know that's blasphemy. I know some of you work in the food and beverage industry and you're offended by this, but others of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And well, if I fill up my belly with some Indian spice chickpeas and jasmine rice after a day of hiking next to a fire, I'm out 10, maybe even 12 hours. I have fallen in love with backpacking since calling the Pacific Northwest home. The Appalachian woods of my youth were quite nice, but they were much more inhabited and less vast. Here, though, I find my place in creation small, quiet, and brief against the backdrop of trees that are going to outlive me by generations, miles between me and the next human being, all human beings, that is, except for Andrew, my friend and trail guide, because though I do love the wilderness, I respect it enough not to just go venturing into it all on my own. And I know probably where you're already thinking, Tyler, those photos are amazing. Where is that place? I've got to get there next summer. I can't tell you. Andrew will never tell you. It's some family secret you have to blood oath into or something like that. And I honestly can't tell you because I'm mostly just wandering behind him talking incessantly while he's guiding us to wherever we end up when we go to sleep that night. Anyway, I remember this one morning waking up by this lake whose coordinates I'll take to my grave and Andrew is out doing something necessary for both of our survival and... I sit quietly and prayerfully looking at the trees, awestruck at the image of the creator whose image is written into the veins on every last leaf, listening to the gentle hymn that is the trees singing as the breeze moves the leaves against one another. But the worship that I was so effortlessly guided into in that moment is not necessarily automatic or universal. Yahweh, the creator behind that creation, to whom those trees sing, is not so obvious to everyone. To paraphrase G.K. Chesterton, there are two kinds of people in this world. Those that think the wind moves the trees, and those who think the trees create the wind. Now hold that thought. Contrary to popular belief, Easter is not a one-day holiday. It's a 50-day celebration. Throughout church history, and I'm very much alive in the global church today, Easter is not a single Sunday of celebration. It is seven weeks of nonstop resurrection celebration. This is very important. If we are to order our lives according to the biblical story and the global church calendar, you and I will fast for 40 days, but we will feast for 50. Don't you love that? I love that. So the 50 days commemorate the resurrection appearances of Jesus to his disciples, leading to his ascension to the right hand of the Father and the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. So today, what I'd like to do is pick up exactly where we left off at the empty tomb last Sunday and trace this story from resurrection to Pentecost in these three acts. Go, wait, and receive. All right, act one, go. Go. So a week ago on Easter, we read from Mark chapter 16, and we concluded in verse 7. But if we were just to keep reading from that very spot, it wouldn't be long before we would come to. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Jesus, in resurrected form, appears to his bewildered disciples with this one simple message, go, according to Mark. But of course, Jesus has not one, but four reputable biographers. So what about the others? 
Well, John remembers it this way. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. There it is again. Go. Matthew authored probably the most famous go of all, typically known as the Great Commission. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So look, you, you get it. The resurrected Jesus has given birth to life, the full and eternal kind of living, and it is growing right here in the corrupted soil of a deceived world. And that life is for anyone humble enough, tired enough, honest enough, or desperate enough to come and receive it. This is the greatest news in human history, and you and I are entrusted to be the carriers of that life. So go, says Jesus. Carry my victorious kingdom everywhere you set your foot and with every word you proclaim with your mouth. Now we're cooking, right? This is like go time in the most literal sense for all of Jesus' followers. Every gospel ends with this epic commissioning of you and me and all who call Jesus king to go on living in this world according to his kingdom until it blankets every square inch of creation. This is the very vision that went on to unwind the Roman Empire, that empowered Martin Luther King's words at the Washington Monument, that lived in Nelson Mandela's gut as he imagined a better world in South Africa than the one he saw until it came to be. This is the vision that redefined human history on an ethical scale more than anything has before or since. It is from Jesus that humility became a virtue and pride became a vice. It's from Jesus that people were redefined in the image of the creator that was written equally into every last individual and not by any different scale. And it is from Jesus that human relationship was redefined by our common humanity rather than caste or status. This vision is that potent and it's that urgent. And that is exactly what makes Luke's final scene a bit of a head scratcher. Luke 24. Jesus told them, this is what was written. The Messiah will suffer many things and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. All right, here comes the big commissioning go. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Every other gospel ends with go, Luke ends with stay. In the ancient Greek that Luke wrote in, stay is kathizo. Can you say that? Well done. Kathizo literally means sit down. It's the polar opposite of going. And Luke is the author of two New Testament books, Luke's Gospel, a biography of Jesus, and then Acts, or the Acts of the Apostles, which is a sequel to the life of Jesus carried out through the lives of Jesus' followers. It's a record of the church's first 30 years or so, essentially a historical record of all of the going that those disciples did after Jesus' resurrection. And the opening scene of Acts, Luke's sequel, looks eerily similar to the closing scene of Luke, the original. Return with me to our teaching text. Look down at your Bibles. I'm going to pick up midway of verse 3. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. If I had to sum up the message of the risen Jesus to his followers on that first Easter Sunday and in the 50 days that follow, I would go with, go, but wait. It's almost like a hair-raising suspense thriller with a triumphant ending, and then as an obvious money grab, the screenwriters just sort of run the script back, sending the main characters right back into the scene they were in before. This is the straw that broke the camel's back for me on Handmaid's Tale. Right after I had lived through so much crudeness that I had to look away from and just an insufferable amount of slow-mo scenes of Elizabeth Moss in a bonnet. 
Still, I, I, I hung through all of that, but then she kept on escaping danger, finally being safe, and then in the season finale, inexplicably just walking right back into danger. It was so obvious that the screenwriters were like, people are still watching this, so should we run it back? And then they did. Only surely that's not what Yahweh is doing here. I mean, he's the perfect writer and director. He's not particularly in the business of money grabbing. So what is the deal? Why the wait? It'll actually make a whole lot more sense if you know the ending. So let's skip over act two. We'll come back for it, but jump right ahead to act three, receive. Jesus does not just say wait. He says, wait for the gift my father promised. And likewise, Jesus doesn't just say stay, he says stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Jesus is saying go, but I've got gifts and power for you to take with you. Be sure to wait for those first. And the gift and power named here, and for what it's worth named in all four gospels, is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinitarian God. Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father so that he might send the Spirit to indwell the lives of his followers. The Spirit then fills broken people with uh, the power and gifts to bring about Jesus' kingdom on the earth. And for those sent but waiting disciples, they received the Spirit this way. And when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Floating, flaming tongues and indoor winds, it just got weird, right? I mean, this is that friend that you hit it off with and you're really digging and then somewhere along the way you discover that they're super into anime. <laughs> and then you're just like rethinking everything you thought you knew. It's a little bit too close for a few of you. I'm just kidding, sort of. But seriously, I mean, just as an isolated event, the Bible just went very sci-fi. But what if this isn't an isolated event? What if it's the coming together of the perfect story by the original writer and director? Within the context and themes of the broader story, this isn't a weird left turn, it is the climactic collision of themes that have been building from the very beginning. Fire and wind are not just found in the biblical story, they are found in key moments in the biblical story, symbolizing God's presence and power with his people through the Spirit. I wanna connect the dots for you, beginning at creation. The opening uh, and famous lines of the whole Bible read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The word translated spirit in this passage is the Hebrew ruach, which interestingly can be translated either as spirit or wind. Genesis creation is depicted as what happens when the spirit or wind blows over the waters of chaos. And at the conclusion of Genesis creation, people inhabit Eden, a heaven on earth spot uh, whose entrance is guarded by fire. So there you have it, at the very beginning of the story, fire and wind representing God's creation and protection for his people. Of course, the full life that God created by his spirit in Genesis 1 then comes apart at the seams in Genesis 3, when the very people made in God's image believe a lie. That is the deception that unwound the whole world, then the deception that lives in me. And that is the deception that God repairs in the very way that he created, by his spirit. And that takes us from the Bible's first book to the second book, Exodus. In the Exodus story, God's presence is depicted frequently as a dense cloud. But the first appearance of that cloud occurs when the author is setting the scene for the resurrection moment in Exodus, if there was one. It's when God takes certain death, like the cross on Good Friday, and he turns it into freedom and life, like the empty tomb on Sunday. That event is the parting of the Red Sea, when Israel, in a scene of certain death, then suddenly experiences a new kind of life. So notice an interesting detail, though, in the way that astonishing victory happened. I wanna to read to you from Exodus 14, picking up right at the moment when the empire of the day, Egypt, has Israel pinned between their army and the sea. 
The pillar of cloud also moved from in front of them and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. So God here is defending his people. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. So how did the sea part? Did you catch it? A strong east wind parted the waters. And this word wind is the Hebrew, anyone have a guess? Ruach which can mean wind or spirit. So hang on, check this out. Creation happened when God's spirit wind blew over the waters, ordering chaos and bringing life. Recreation happened when God's spirit wind blew over the waters of the Red Sea, ordering chaos and bringing life. And this theme of fire and wind, a cloud guiding God's people to freedom that blows like the wind to rescue them and glows like fire in the dark, it's a theme that carries on Throughout the Exodus drama, a cloud guides Israel through the wilderness and the desert. A cloud descends on Mount Sinai to meet with God, where, or to meet with Moses, where God will speak to him face to face as one speaks to a friend. The cloud of fire and wind that first appeared at the Red Sea is a cloud that appears again at the final scene of Exodus just before the credits roll. When after God has instructed Moses to build a tabernacle, at the completion of that tabernacle, God comes to dwell with his people. So there's this scene where the tabernacle is finished building and I imagine the camera beginning to pan out and the soundtrack beginning to play and then the voice of the narrator, Morgan Freeman, it's always Morgan Freeman, <laughs> comes in and says this over the Exodus story. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day and the fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all the Israelites during their travels. Those are the final words of Exodus. Fire and wind making a home with God's people. And that takes us ahead to Jesus. John chapter one describes the arrival or the birth of Jesus this way. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Dwelling is skenoo in the ancient Greek that the New Testament was written in, meaning tabernacle. The most direct translation of this verse is the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. So the Old Testament pattern is build a tabernacle, then God fills it with his spirit. John has just described Jesus as a tabernacle filled with God's spirit. The very spirit of God present at creation, the spirit that parted the Red Sea, the spirit that dwelt among God's people in the tabernacle is not now dwelling not just among but within this man Jesus. He is a living, breathing, walking, talking tabernacle. Not only that, but the gospels keep pointing forward to a day when the same spirit tabernacling in Jesus will tabernacle within the lives of all of Jesus' followers. And the gospel writers make that promise through a couple of familiar metaphors, fire and wind. John the Baptist, sent to prepare the way for Jesus, said, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I then I will come, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The word Holy Spirit is the Greek pneuma, which translates as wind or spirit. Isn't that interesting? John the Baptist says, one is coming after me who's going to baptize you in fire and wind. And he says that to Israelites who know exactly what he's talking about. Later, Jesus, just before ascending to the Father in Acts 1, says this to his disciples. Look again with me at your Bibles, verse 4. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. A fire and wind baptism. That's what Jesus says is coming. That's what they're waiting for. And so finally now we're back at the day of Pentecost where we began. And with all of that context in mind, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. 
So what's going on on the day of Pentecost? It's not a a sci-fi spectacle. The very spirit that blew over the waters at Genesis creation, the very spirit that that parted the Red Sea at Exodus recreation, the very spirit that filled the tabernacle so that God would dwell among us, the very spirit that filled Jesus, the spirit of fire and wind has now come to fill, to make a home within all who follow Jesus. I'm going to send you what my father promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. You, if you are a follower of Jesus, have been filled with the very power that parted the Red Sea, the very power that pushed back the stone and brought life to Jesus' body, says the Apostle Paul. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you've heard me speak about. You, if if you are a follower of Jesus, have been tabernacled by the very Spirit that made a home in Jesus. The Apostle Paul went on to break it down like this. Don't you know that you yourselves, reads 1 Corinthians 3. Now in in Greek, there's several different words for you, making it clear when we're talking about an individual you or a collective or communal you. And here it's the plural, it's the collective sense. In English, we've just got the one you, which is probably why the South invented y'all. And it's why in this passage we read this kind of clumsy phrasing, you yourselves, because we're talking about the collective. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? There's still a tabernacle. There's still a place where God's fire and wind spirit dwells. It's you. It's y'all. It's the church, not the building, but the collective lives of Jesus' followers. There's even more than that though. Chapter six of the very same letter. Do you not know that your bodies, now this time it's the individual, it's your individual physical body that we're talking about here. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own, you were bought with a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. You, your individual physical body is filled with the fire and wind that filled the Exodus tabernacle and that filled Jesus. You are the here and now dwelling place of God. You are a living, breathing, walking, talking tabernacle. How are you guys doing? Are you hanging with me? All right. I tried to do something, you know, with a little Handmaid's Tale humor and that whole backpacking thing was cute. Because I know I'm not making this super sexy for you, but you have to admit that the story at face value is pretty good, isn't it? But there is this one question, if you're paying close attention, that I think you should be asking. Why the wait? I mean, if you're God, and you're planning to give a gift this good, why isn't Easter a one-day celebration, and the day of Pentecost comes the Monday after? What are these 50 days about? Why the wait? All right, that brings us back to the middle, the bit that we skipped over, act two, wait. There's both a thematic and a practical element to waiting on the spirit. There's a when and a why. So first, the when. Pentecost is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word shavot, that means the festival of weeks. Originally, this is one of three Jewish pilgrimage festivals that is given by Yahweh in in the book of Exodus that all Israel was meant to observe. And in one of these pilgrimage festivals, all the Jewish people would travel from every corner of the Roman Empire to Jerusalem. Everyone from every different tribe and region would descend on this one city for a massive week-long celebration. I imagine it kind of like trying to find a spot in a a city park in Portland on the first sunny Saturday each spring. Super fun, pure chaos. So in Acts 2, the entire nation's gathered into one city, people from every different tribe, language, and class. Every corner of society is packing the narrow streets. If you wanted to say something that got all the way to the ends of the earth, you could not pick a better day than this one. If you wanted to give a gift, not just to a particular tribe or sect or clique, but to everyone who'd receive it, you could not pick a better day than this one. 
tongues of fire then descend on that little upper room and all these people began proclaiming Jesus. But miraculously, the onlooking crowd made up of many different tribes and languages, each hear them in their own dialect. Now there's just as much biblical history be behind that miracle as there is behind the fire and wind thing we've been tracing and we'll get there in a future week. But for today, you need to know this much, that Jesus waited on the day of Pentecost because this gift, God filling my life with his very life is for everyone who believes. It's for old and young, men and women, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This life is for everyone, and if you wanna give a gift to everyone, you couldn't have picked a better day than this one. The climactic events from Jesus' life, they're all supercharged with meaning in the biblical story because of when. Jesus times his death for Passover, and he times the gift of the Spirit for Pentecost, which was a harvest celebration commemorated by the giving of first fruits. So when the air gets crisp and the first bits of grain are ripe on the end of the stalk for picking, uh, there, that was an early sign of a harvest that was to follow. And at that time, all of the Jewish people would collect those first bits of grain, that first fruits, travel to Jerusalem, and offer it to God as a way of saying thank you and let's celebrate the harvest that is to come. The day of Pentecost then, when the Spirit was given, is the fulfillment of generations of Israelite people knowing God as first fruits, as signs of this coming fuller promise, and the gift of the Holy Spirit is harvest season. The abundance that Israel has been waiting on is finally fully given significant days in the story of Israel, a story crafted by God himself, pointing forward to a fuller fulfillment that Jesus then comes to bring. And that's exactly what he said he was here for, right? Do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And that's exactly what he's doing. But that still leaves the other side of the coin. We've got the win. What about the why? Why do we need to wait on the Spirit before we go? There is great danger in attempting the works of the kingdom without the power of the Spirit. And that's because something changes, dramatically changes, when we stop asking God to get in on our plan and we start asking how to get in on his plan. We cannot rush into action, even good action, full of inspiration. We can't rush into action because the cost is too high and the imagination is too small. Let's break that down. First, the cost is too high. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit will give you power and make you witnesses. That sounds great, right? But witness is the... Greek word martis, from which we get the English martyr. I'm gonna give you my spirit so that you can go out and proclaim my kingdom. Jesus absolutely means that. I'm gonna give you my spirit so that you can die. Jesus absolutely means that. And it's not hyperbole, read on. I mean, sometimes there is an actual bodily, physical death for one's faith, much like Jesus endured on the cross, but always there's a living kind of dying. For instance, there's this highlight reel at the end of Acts 2 of what a spirit-empowered community looks like. Most have heard it before. It goes like this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many uh, wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You know, plenty of people, when they imagine a spirit-empowered community, imagine signs and wonders. Healing, prophecy, deliverance, miracle work. And that's there for sure. Others, imagine a spirit-empowered community. Uh, imagine breaking bread in homes, family, love for neighbor and stranger alike, hospitality in every variety, and that's there for sure too. But how many of us imagine holding every possession we have in common with others? 
selling off the house that you just closed on after working toward it for so long so that you could meet the practical needs of someone else, practical needs that you had no hand in creating. Is that even wise? Is that prudent? What does that even look like in a a world of savings accounts and investments and rainy day funds and outstanding loans? I mean, there's a living kind of dying to living this way with our wealth and possessions, isn't there? And study the history. I mean, this is not a moment with a couple of really inspired dudes. This was the the way that the early church lived for several hundred years. The early church had the audacity to make all of Jesus' teaching, including the approximately 25% of it that is directly about money and possessions, all of Jesus' teaching, the cultural norm for their everyday lives. If If the hungry came to the early church and the church did not have any food to feed them, the collective community would fast until they could sit down together as equals and break bread with one another. That was the common practice life of the early church. Basil the Great, writing in the fourth century, said this, when someone strips a man of his clothes, we call him a thief. And one who might clothe the naked and does not, should he not be given the same name? The bread in your cupboard belongs to the hungry. The coat in your wardrobe belongs to the naked. The shoes you let rot belong to the barefoot. The money in your vault belongs to the destitute. They're not reluctantly parting with their unwanted possessions. Material wealth for this community has become nothing more than a rental meant to be stewarded on behalf of others. If I have plenty, it's because Jesus is empowering me to live like his kingdom is real with it and therefore use it to meet the needs of those who are living in poverty. And I'm only selecting generosity with wealth and possessions as an example of this living sort of dying that the Spirit empowers because, one, most people don't associate that with the Holy Spirit, though it's right there on the page, and two, because we happen to live in a time and place when materialism and greed with wealth and possessions is in the cultural waters that we swim in, and that means This has almost certainly gotten into me and you too. You see, the broader teaching and the mistake that I think many of us make when it comes to Pentecost is this, to yearn for the spectacle without counting the cost. And I hope you yearn for the spectacular. And I hope you count the cost. The sacrificial death of Jesus that that we are empowered by the Spirit to follow him into, it's called his passion from the Latin passio, meaning willing to suffer for. What are you passionate about? What are you willing to suffer for? Honestly, let your life tell you. And maybe you'll suffer to some degree or another for career accolades or upward mobility. Maybe you'll suffer for, in order to make your body look the way you want it to. Maybe you'll suffer to prove yourself, whatever that means for you. See, we live in a culture that suffers for things with an expiration date. The truth is no one cares about your resume at your funeral, no one's body looks tight in the nursing home, and no one's paying attention to whatever you're proving except for you. In a culture obsessed with comfort and averse to suffering, those who live by passion will shape history. Everyone who has ever shaped history did so by passion, by willing suffering by having a vision of the future that made present suffering worth it. Lasting legacy always has been and always will be tied to present suffering. And the Holy Spirit teaches me what to suffer for and what to die to. The Holy Spirit teaches and empowers me to live passionately in this world. So long for the spectacular and count the cost. That's what we're doing while we wait on the gift of the Spirit that the Father promised. The cost is too high, and the imagination's too small. Look with me at our teaching text one last time, Acts chapter one, verse six. Just before Jesus drops this whole martyr line on the disciples, they ask him a really interesting question. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now are you going to reign over Israel, throwing off the chains of oppression of other nations? 
Now are you going to set right all in Israel, restoring Eden to our soil? Now can we take our positions of power and authority to reign with you at your right and left? Now can everything be fixed? Can we be recognized and can the circumstances align like we've imagined? The disciples had this sort of kingdom in mind before the cross. And then a crazy twist happened and it seems like they're picking up exactly where they left off. Now that you're back, Jesus, can we get down to business? It's a good question, even a very good desire, but Jesus' kingdom is still far more surprising than they had dared imagine. Two competing visions are alive and well in Acts chapter two. The disciples are asking, is now the time you're gonna restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus, is now the time you're gonna make my world right or make our world right? And Jesus says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now's the time I'm going to make the world right. The disciples' desire is right and good, but the way Jesus is going to get there is still a surprise. It is a more personal, more beautiful, and more participatory way of redeeming the whole world than anyone had conceived of to this point. In Genesis, the spirit wind blows over the unformed chaos waters and God creates. In Exodus, the spirit wind blows over the unformed chaos waters and God recreates. God does not call this world broken, dust off his hands and get onto a new project. God enters into this broken and corrupted world and recreates right from within it. And this Genesis verb create, bara, it is used exclusively with God as the subject in our Bibles. Men and women do not create. Angelic or heavenly beings do not create. Satan and his demons cannot create. Only God creates. And the theme of God as creator becomes more demonstrative after the serpent's deception than it was before. The verb create appears in our Bibles most frequently not in Genesis, but in Isaiah. Isaiah is a collection of prophecies written from exile the ancient equivalent of a refugee camp. And it was there in the incomprehensible sorrow of forced displacement that create appears most frequently in the Hebrew Bible. How do you live in touch with what God is redeeming today in a world as cha- that is filled with as much interruption and chaos as forced oppression? Well, the power of the Holy Spirit has to look like a redeemed imagination before it looks like a renewed world. This is a painting by Rene Magritte. The artist is looking at an egg, but painting a bird in flight. The artist is not seeing what is, but beyond what is to what is possible. This is Isaiah in exile, seeing not what's there, but beyond it to what is possible. This is the spirit-shaped imagination to see what is possible if the spirit wind of creation power has filled my everyday life and the chaos inevitably within it. See, almost all of us put the spirit's power in far too cramped of a box. We, in our own unique ways, fall prey to confined, small imaginations, one where the power of the Holy Spirit surely feels like comfortable conditions and effortless flow of power, but not chaos, not the waters of chaos. A spirit-empowered life begins with a spirit-shaped imagination. Isaiah chapter 49, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I've kept. I will also make you a light to the Gentiles that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. You see, there it is. It's what Jesus has to say in Acts 1 all the way back in exile. Before the immaculate conception of the miraculous ministry, before the sacrificial death or the triumphant resurrection, before the appearance of the risen Lord, all the way back in exile, there's a prophet with a spirit-shaped imagination saying, I can see even here the signs that God is working, not just a way to make my world right or even our world right, but to make the world right. We have to wait on the spirit because you and I are forever tempted toward a good but too small vision of where and how and among whom God the creator is working by the power of his spirit. It is too small a thing, 
that you would limit the creative power of the Holy Spirit to comfortable conditions because the Spirit can create within chaos. It is too small a thing for you to have a faith that survives your workplace when you have been filled with the resurrection power of Jesus and the one who leaves the 99 to go after the one. It is too small a thing that you would complain about the policies and procedures of our city when it comes to the houselessness without learning the name and the story of a single individual. It is too small a thing that, that you would live for the weekend and rest by escape when the adventure of your life is unfolding right under your nose if only you would tune your imagination to the spirit that's as alive and creative today as he ever has been in creation history. What are you living for that's too small? You don't need my help. If the spirit of the living God is within you, you likely already know. And the same spirit that convicts us of visions that are too small also expands our imaginations if we surrender. Because something changes, dramatically changes, when we stop asking God to get on board with our plan and we start asking how to get in on his. So this is an introduction to the teaching series that will lead us up to and then even beyond Pentecost Sunday, the gifts of the Spirit for the work of the kingdom. We'll be taking a look at the Holy Spirit from a more practical vantage point as a community of practitioners. What are the gifts of this indwelling fire and wind spirit that I'm empowered to live by? So in the weeks to come, we're going to cover witness, healing, discernment, prophecy, groaning, tongues, and a number of others. And along the way, we'll hear from different voices from within our pastoral team and a couple familiar faces from across the pond as well. And we'll gather in this room on a Tuesday evening as Bridgetown communities uh, to practice both supernatural healing through prayer and to hold that intention with the God who also redeems us through redemptive suffering. And there should be quite a fun journey together, yes? So I wanna end where we started. I sleep best in the woods. I can remember this one morning listening to the gentle hymn that is the trees singing through the rustle of the leaves produced by the morning breeze. But of course the worship and prayer that I was so effortlessly guided into that morning is not necessarily automatic or universal. The wind spirit revealed by creation to whom those trees sing, it's not so obvious to everyone because there's two kinds of people in this world. Those who know the wind moves the trees and those who think that the trees create the wind. And Jesus himself used a metaphor a lot like that. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. You see, like those trees I was listening to that morning, it is the Spirit that moves us not the other way around. So go, but wait. Do you wanna be clothed with power from on high? Do you wanna receive in increasing measure the gift the Father has promised? Then ask and wait to be sent by the Spirit whose wind leads and guides us as waiting, praying people.